All right, now first of all, I am not trying to convert anybody. Okay, Judaism does not have any forced conversions. Um, so this is just those people who are interested, uh, we're going to go through what is this all really about. I deal with a Haredi based in, which is, uh, you know, these black hat people. Um, there's a lot of misinformation about different types of conversion. Unlike Christianity, where there's Methodists and Catholics and Episcopalians, and they're all Christians. And there may be people who want to, you know, uh, renew certain vows, become part of one group versus the other, but they're all Christians. Reform, or as I call it, deformed uh, Judaism, um, and uh, conservative, which I learned in the conservative uh, rabbinical school. Um, so, uh, so this is not Judaism. They are Jews. And as I explained to Moshe in the Val yesterday, if a person were a shogun warrior, and he has a child who becomes, you know, a, a hippie, but my father's a uh, shogun warrior. So I'm a shogun warrior, right? No. You have a different culture, completely. Your beliefs are completely different. We're not allowed, a religious Jew is not allowed to walk into a church because it's considered a place of idol worship. I'm not allowed to walk into a deformed synagogue because it's not a synagogue and it's a place of idol worship. Ah, oh, but there's no images. If you don't believe that the Torah was written by Hashem, if you preach things that are not true, that is idol worship. And as such, I'm not allowed to walk into a conservative or into a reform synagogue. It's not a synagogue. It's a place made by Jews, but not everything that's Jewish is Judaism. And um, the difference between Hasidic, Litvak, Yemenite, all, you know, Sephardic, who cares? That's all Judaism. That's called different flavors. You know, chocolate or vanilla, it's still ice cream. Um, that's Judaism. So we're going to talk about what people call Orthodox Judaism, which is simply Torah Judaism. Conversion is not a simple thing. In order to go through a conversion, you have to accept upon yourself the Torah and all of the Torah in the same way that the Jews accepted it at Sinai. The statement that the Jews said at that time was, Nasev and Ishma. We will hear and then we will do. Sorry, sorry, sorry. We will do and then we will hear. The exact opposite. In other words, this is Hashem's will. We are, go we are accepting upon ourselves everything, every single aspect of Judaism all of the laws. When the Jews accepted that at Sinai, then for them and all their generations after them, they're Jewish. Their covenant is unbreakable. For a person coming in, I've had a lot of students who say to me, yeah, but why do I have to be more religious than the Jews around me? And the answer is, because you're not Jewish. They're doing something wrong. By them not following even the, the smallest little detail of a mitzvah, they're doing something wrong. They have to answer for that. We're the chosen people. Chosen doesn't mean we're chosen because we're so great. You're chosen to serve. And if you are from the seed of Abraham, you must follow all the mitzvahs. If not, you're problematic. To become Jewish, you have to accept all of the Torah. If there's even one mitzvah that a convert says, that one is a little bit too much for me. Whether it be something in the kosher laws, something in the dress code. So, you don't have to wear a black hat, don't worry. Um, so, uh, although in Texas you probably could, you know. Um, so, white hats, techno, Hatfields, McCoys. Um, so, um, it's a very serious undertaking. It's not something that, oh, well, you'll grow into it. The attitude of all of the kosher based ins is you're not going through a conversion until you already are 100% observant. This means before we get anywhere close to going through the conversion, you have to be staying kosher completely. Oh, but wait a minute. I'm not Jewish, and therefore the food that I cook because of rabbinic law would still be not considered kosher. Don't worry about it. 
You have to be doing whatever you can so that when you go to the mikveh and you come out, it's not like, okay, now I'm starting with something new. It has to be old hack. It has to be something, this is the way I have been acting already. You have to already, if you're a guy, be going to Minyan three times a day. That's not an option. That's not, oh, well, if I want to. No, you have to go to Minyan three times a day. That means I have to live in an area where I'm in a Jewish community that I can get to a Minyan three times a day. I have to be following Shabbos completely, not whichever way I want. One of the main characters in my book was Avi. You'll see it when you read the book. He's a combination of two students, both descendants of Nazis, one a child of, one a grandchild of, of Nazi. Um, his, or their, uh, these two people who were my students, intensity of um, intellect and love of Hashem was uh, quite incredible. And what one of these students said, who's obviously said in the book, is that um, when he went to the Basin, what he was doing was choosing to not choose. When you're a Ben Noach, you still are choosing. You're a volunteer. You are serving Hashem. Um, you have seven mitzvahs, and you decide to volunteer for many things. Well, we know that serving Hashem voluntarily is nowhere near as hard as serving when you're told that you must do this. Just think of, you've all pretty much had teenagers, right? We've all suffered this. Um, so when you have a teenager, they start to, as we say in, in Hebrew, they, they kick. Well, that doesn't mean they actually kick your shins. They don't like to be told what to do. When a person is volunteering as a Ben Noach to say, well, I'm going to follow many mitzvahs. I'm going to learn Torah. I can, I can do lots of these misses. It's wonderful. Yeah, well, when you convert, now you have to. And there's no turning back. Because the person who is converted to Judaism, it doesn't matter if they convert out. They are Jewish. And their children are Jewish forever. You're accepting upon yourself a uh, set of mitzvahs that you have no out from. And that's why this concept of people fe feeling that it's so impossible to get in. Why do the Jews not you know, welcome us? Because if you're a good Ben Noach, great. It's pretty easy to do that. And you can be a wonderful, decent human being. You want to be Jewish? That's much better. But that's only if you actually stay with it. And the level of responsibility is exponential to what most people are used to in what Western societies call a religious lifestyle. Um, going through the based in, <sighs> there are a lot of problems doing it in Israel, very big problems. Uh, I don't know how much you guys know. You're all very pro-Israel. That's wonderful. Um, I'm not an anti-Zionist or anything like that. I'm not throwing stones at anybody. We're just going to talk about practical realities. In the book, which is on the back table, one, uh, one of the main chapters is written by one of my students, who is one of the ones who had a harder time. I've had students who had worse. And you think, how could it be worse than Binyam, uh, Aviyah Binyamas? They've been worse. Okay. Basically, the state of Israel is not a religious institution. In fact, in many ways, they are anti-religious. How is this possible? It's the Jewish state. It is a state of Jews. It is a place where Jews are able to live. I'm very happy to be there, I'm very happy that we have a government, that we have an army. But to say that this is our you know, saving grace here, you know, and depend upon the state and the government for anything religiously, no. Okay. The Ministry of the Interior was at a fight with me in the Supreme Court in Israel. I had 20-something, I forgot, there was 28 students who have a Supreme Court case, which is ongoing right now. Um, you can't convert in Israel anymore, realistically, unless you have a Jewish relative. Why? Um, the state of Israel said, the Ministry of Interior said, in front of me, in front of the, um, uh, what do you call it, the, the Supreme Court, they said, we're only dealing with population problems. 
somebody is able to come into this country because they're running away from whichever country, their grandfather is Jewish, okay, they come here, they wish to feel part of society, we will allow through the ministry of the Rabbanut that they can become Jewish and feel part of the society. If somebody comes in and they want to become Jewish from the outside, walls start to rise up out of the floor in front of these people. It didn't used to be that way. Michal Lawson, who was the main author of the book that's on the back table, who helps people helps us figure out who is a missionary infiltrator or whatever, she did the Rabbanu. Her conversion was just fine. That was quite a while ago. It really wasn't so bad. I mean, she talks about her story. It has some kinks in the road, but nothing compared to today. Today, if you are planning on moving to Israel, convert here. And, you know, then your conversion from here will be accepted there. Many people who come to me from here, who come from based in, I don't want to mention names, I just heard about one this morning where the standards seemed to me to be um, low, um, and there was no personal instruction. People just learn from books, come and meet the based in a few times, and that's it. There's no one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I don't know how people could possibly you know, get all the knowledge they need. So people end up coming to Israel, and the conversion might not be accepted by the whole Jewish world. If the person went through any type of an Orthodox conversion, and it was serious, even though it's not accepted by everybody, don't worry, our Basin takes care of that. A teacher, myself, Many others at the base then will test the person, see who they are, have them over their house for Shabbos, you know, see, are there any holes? If so, fill in the holes. Sometimes the holes kind of look like a net. Um, but, uh, so, um, but if a person already is Jewish and they're just not accepted by the outside world, that's where our base then comes in. Um, there are plenty of people, I was dealing with somebody who dealt with the RCA, which is acceptable by most, not everybody in Israel. And they said, can we, and I, I taught them for the RCA over here. And um, they came to Israel. It was like a revolving door. In and out of the base, did no problem. If the person really was honest, really did things properly, getting a conversion, the Chumrah, which means a, um, Chumrah, English. Uh, uh, certified or recognized. Uh -huh. Yeah, you know, is no big deal. It's nothing. What the problem is, is when people come in and think that they've become Jewish from some deformed thing or whatever, and they're not, um, they're not Jewish at all. Uh, or people who are B'nai Noach, who come and leave everything, leave their job, sell their home, end up in Ben-Gurion Airport, I'm here, I've arrived, you know, where's the red carpet? <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, they find out that it's full of mud, um, there's no way through it. And, we can't help you at our base then, if that's the situation. Mm -hmm. Because the government has put every stricture and wall in front of these people. I teach people all over the world. Right now I'm on telephone uh, for a couple hours a week to um, Australia, I'm teaching a lady in Delaware. There's another lady in England. They're all over the place on, on the phone. And besides the ones who come in, I had people come in from Brazil, they come in, they learn with me, they go back. Okay, they have money in Brazil. Um, so they're on the plane all the time. But, you know, in and back and in and back, okay, no problem. One thing which might be going through people's minds, you know, how much does all this cost? There's a lot of charlatans in the world, a lot of charlatans. And when you go to some of these places where there's a demand of money in the beginning, I've heard in America that that's standard, so I'm not talking about that. But if you're dealing with somebody on a private thing, a money demand is, um, it has a bad odor, okay, for me. Um, I'll tell you how I do this. I'm not saying everyone does it this way, but this is the way the Basin told me to deal with it. In the beginning, I only had one or two students a year. Each student, 50 to 150 hours of you know one-on-one -on -one teaching. And then the Basin started sending me more and more to the point where I have a very good job and um, I'm working more teaching people than I am supporting my eight children. So this became a little uh, difficult, and uh, where's the money coming from? Because it was all volunteer, the first, like I think, 30 students, and don't think I got a penny. And then the, um, 
the base then said, okay, this is how you tell the people. And this is what I say to everybody who comes. I don't want to know whether you do or do not have money. I'm going to tell you what you could do as a volunteer afterwards. But if you're poor, you can become Jewish. If you're rich, you can become Jewish. I want to treat everybody exactly the same. Therefore, don't tell me whether you do or do not intend on paying. Um, and I tell people to just keep track of the hours. And I tell them what I make at my own job. And if you have the ability at the end to remunerate for that, great. And if you don't like most of them, so it's a freebie. It gets a little difficult. But you know something? Hashem runs the world. And um, if you're sitting here trying to help people serve Hashem, I can't imagine it's going to let me fall into the gutter along with my eight kids. OK, and some of the students are very nice. And some of them are very nice, but don't have anything. And I have one student who, you know, after a while, got himself back on his feet and went to work and everything else. OK, and so every month or so, something dribbles in. Great. And no one signs anything. No one is obligated. When you start getting into these obligated situations, keep your eyes open. There's a lot of very bad people under very good guises in the world. And religion is, no, um, is not immune to people who are trying to take advantage of you. Especially when you say, who is the most disadvantaged group? They've left Christianity because they realize the falseness of the whole thing. And they're in a shambles having left their sham. Um, and they now want to come into truth. And they'll do anything to get in. They're stuck. Do you have any more, um, you know, much of a target to, you know, put your uh, charlatanism on against, except for these people? So, uh, basically, people, you should keep your eyes open. What do I expect people to know when they go through the Basin? I have a little bit higher standards than the other teachers. This is why the Basin tends to always call me. Yes, OK, how many are coming this week? You know, it's, like, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a lot. Um, but the standards are high because I don't, I don't think that people should go through without knowing really what they're getting into. And not only that, I'm going to tell you a great story. This is going to be a little shocking. The, the Syrian community specifically, not all Sephardim, the Syrian community has a edict that they made when they left um, Syria at the forming of the state of Israel. Many of them moved. They saw Israel was becoming a secular state. It was an extremely religious community. They did not want to go there, they mainly came to Deal and to a few other places in America. And um, they had an edict. Anybody who marries a convert is not allowed in our community. It's horrible. It's completely not standard in Torah Judaism. Why was it happening? Because they were a community that was completely insular, going out into the big wide world. And they saw people intermarrying, and the community was falling apart. And they're very into family, so they said, you're not even allowed in the shul. They said, this will stop the problem. I understand them, but it's very painful. I had a student come to me, a lady from Bogota, Colombia. She's basically, she and this Jewish man um, were an item. And his pa family said, you will never marry a non-Jew. Okay, He's Syrian. And uh, there's this whole problem with conversion. They will not do a conversion in Colombia. He sent her to Israel. She learned at first by one of my colleagues. After about six months of learning, she called him and she said, um, I'm a religious person now. Uh, we're no longer an item until you become religious. By the way, that is a standard by the based in. If there's a couple, they both go through the class because, and the class means they both, we have to see that, let's say he's the Jew. He's a secular Jew. She's a religious convert. No way are we doing the conversion. How, why would she want a secular guy? He's got to be of the same level as her. He's got to be in yeshiva. He's got to, we, this is, this is no, no go either way. Well, what was the end of this? 
uh, he learned by me, and then they learned by me after she was learning by this other lady. Fantastic. Went through the conversion, went back to Bogota, where they didn't accept them. After a few weeks, I got a call from the Revitson of Bogota. She said, we're having a problem. I said, what? You sent somebody who knows more than the Revitson. <laughs> and um, I said, that's standard by our base. Then she said, I did my research. I found out you're right. She said, um, she's teaching people more than I'm teaching. She's unbelievable. We're accepting her. This is standard that the students from the base then go into yeshivas all over the world, and they are the ones that people ask the questions of. Because the Beis Din has taught us a method of teaching people halacha that is fun, enjoyable, personal, and very real. Why? Because there's no apologetics. And there's no, like with a Baal Tshuva, as myself, you know, you go to a Baal Tshuva yeshiva, and they feel they don't want to push you away. They're scared. Maybe, you know, we'll push them a little too hard. So every time you do a mitzvah a little better, you're only doing it halfway. They say, oh, Mazel Tov, you did so good. Don't, don't worry. Don't push yourself. Don't push yourself. You know, you don't want to have, you know, uh, spiritual indigestion, right? Um, but when you're dealing with somebody coming in as a convert, it's like, hello. If you don't accept the whole thing, goodbye. And be a very nice Ben Noah. That's fine. We're not like, you know, we're not like the people who say that you're cursed if you don't believe in what we believe. Ben Noah, go right ahead. But you want to come in? There's no apologetics. A conversion course is a, it's not I'm trying to convince you of something. If I'm trying to convince you of something, we'll give you more books, keep reading, you want to come back. I had one guy who came back three separate times he came back. This was over the course of year and a half, two years. It was the longest that it ever took me. He went back and forth to university, and um, he wanted to learn Talmudic studies in a secular environment where his uh, pref professor, Mrs. Whatever, was teaching him um, certain uh, part of the Talmud, and I'm like, um, been there, done that at the conservative rabbinical school. It's not real Judaism till he was able to realize that his entire career as a, he was learning to be a professor in Talmud had to go out the window um, and drop it all uh, was not exactly easy. You can relate. Uh, <laughs> so, and so, um, okay. Uh, how long should this take? If we're dealing with generally intelligent people who have you know, let's say past freshman year of college, you know how to do a term paper, you know how to, they say, here are these five books, read them by the end of the week, okay? Uh, that type of person, there's no reason that if the person is committed and not coming fresh out of Christianity, but they've already gotten to the point where, you know, they're in a B'nai Noach type group, six months, but they need to be part of the Jewish community. And that does not mean that three days before the conversion, oh, I just, you know, I rented an apartment next to the shul on the other side of town. Uh, no, we need letters from people in that community that you're going there for Shabbos to their homes, that you're seen in the shul, if you're a guy, three times a day, not for the past week. Okay, you're there. You're part of the community. Um, the based in is a little bit, um, I can say it obnoxious um, when it comes to Facebook. Lots of bad things are done by people. And there is a specific lady, her entire job, she's not at the base then because she's a woman. They don't want her to know there's lots of, uh, they try to stay away from anything which is promiscuous in behavior. The, she's dealing with it at her home. Her job is to hack into your um, Facebook. All the closed Facebooks, you think they're closed, right? Okay. Wrong, okay? And uh, so they will find you, they will find any previous um, name you were mentioned by. If you uh, sign up at, at the base in B'nai Brak, 
there is nothing about your life that you won't uh, know about. By the way, there are some times when they actually surprise the teachers and don't tell us. You show up at the base then with what you think is, you know, this absolute unbelievable person. And then, you know, everything looks great. And then they start pulling out things which they've copied off of the Facebook saying, um, what about this? And I just like, you know, like, what? what? Like, you know, I had no idea. Now, it doesn't happen that often. Why? Because the general situation is most of my students are close friends. Why? Why do they spend 50 to 150 hours with a person one on one in your house for Shabbos after Shabbos after Shabbos? Your kids are going to the playground with them back and forth. You know these people well, okay? It's not uh, usually a class. I mean, Reuven had spoken about the possibility of maybe teaching a class over here over the phone or over the Skype. I'd be happy to do it. I have never dealt with a class before. Um, you know, it's generally conversion needs to be dealt with on a one-to-one -one basis. If this class does occur, I'd be thrilled to do it. It really depends on, on Reuven. You people are super respectful. You have to kind of lower the, uh, what we call in Hebrew, distance, which means distance. In other words, if there's something you don't understand, stop me, interrupt me, contradict me, speak to me. Because if we're going to be dealing with something over the phone or over the Skype, giving a dry class, it, it needs to be one-on-one. -on -one. And if there are five, six, seven people in a class, I need to know everybody. And what are you understanding? What are you not understanding? What seemed too difficult. What is your problem here? You know, maybe you need an extra book on something. Maybe you shouldn't be in this class. I mean, whatever it is, it's got to be individual. So if this will occur, it's got to be not like this. I understand in this situation it is, but it's got to be a lot of give and take. And all the thing about the respect for the rabbi, that the hat goes off and I'm Zalman, okay? And we're just sitting there talking as people who are trying to get to a goal of you becoming the best Jew you possibly can be. Mm -hmm. And that can only happen by a personal relationship. Okay. Um, other issues? Any questions on conversion? There's lots of issues. So ask. So you're talking about a class for conversion. Right. But we wouldn't qualify because of the uh, not living in a Jewish community. Okay, there's yes and no. The class, there's beginnings, and then there's as the person is approaching the point where, where we're almost there. It will become very obvious to a person who, once we finish just the laws of Shabbos, that I've got to get out of here. Now, get out of here doesn't mean I have to leave Houston. I've got to move to the other end of town. Once you start to learn more in a way that is a very honest method of teaching where it's this is what you have to do. Then um, if a person wishes to say this is too much, it's very easy to leave. A person who stays is obviously committed. They're going to move on their own. There were the few cases where I had to prompt the person, actually the lady in Delaware right now, because unfortunately her daughter had a heart attack when she gave birth to her third child right after a divorce. And her daughter is, has one of these vests on. She can't leave right. her daughter. And she's in a part of Delaware where there is only a deformed mm -hmm. synagogue. Okay, So she's going out to Baltimore every Shabbos, and we're dealing with the basin, trying to see how we can deal with this. You know, it's uh, not everything in life is simple, yeah. as you can tell. Um, <laughs> life has got lots of uh, turns. So yeah. Uh, explain to them that the, the benefit of taking a class like this for you is to really kind of get the nuts and bolts of how to learn. Is that when you go to this thing locally, in Dallas or Chicago, that you're so much further along because of the fact that there really isn't a structured system of study for students here. I mean, that's just the way it is in, in, in our area. So when you sit down with the base for the first time, and you begin to express how you've been studying and what you know, it, it's going to expedite your, your time, obviously, that you would normally probably have to spend. Explain to them about the individual that studied and then came back. Um, 
the one in California, the RCA in California. California where the person came back and they just immediately, once they did, you know, sort of tested them, he was. Yes, okay. I'm sorry, I'm trying to remember which one I told you about, but I know there was one case for, there's so many of them. Um, there was one case, there was a boy and a girl, both not Jewish. Um, and at a certain point through the class, we actually had to have them separate because even though you know, they're, you know, they were married, okay, if they were married, they could stay together until the end. Um, it, so, you know, promiscuity is not allowed. We were learning, they each Skyped each other and then called me via the Skype, okay, which was on a telephone. Um, they were preparing for the base din. Over there, they had about um, a year and something left, because I think the program over there was a year and a half. I learned with them for a few months. And they asked them, they said, can we just uh, be tested? And they said, come on, there's no way you could possibly have done this much in this short period of time. I said, just test us. And they wouldn't admit for the next week. And I cannot make any guarantees for Bastins all around the world. Each Bastin has its own rules. I'll tell you a shocking situation was there was a guy who had spent two years in England. You know English people, they're very not like Texas. Texas is laid back. English. They never saw a corner that they didn't want to cut their finger on, you know. It, uh, so um, they have rules and protocols coming out of your eardrums. Um, so two years is two years. That's it. No way around it. So this guy did almost two years. was just about ready to finish his conversion. But he had the stupid idea that um, I want to become Jewish in Israel. Oh, great. Okay. So when you leave the system of... England and you opened up a file the next base then he has to start at the beginning of the two years over there again he can't do it in in Israel legally our base then took care of it okay um, but what happened was I learned with him I figured this guy's finished right I learned with him very intensely because he was going back not to England actually back to Greece for a short period and whatever so um, I learned with him for three weeks, something like that, every day for about two to three hours. And he said to me at the end, after I came out of the mikvah, he said, I learned more in three weeks than I did in two years. Because in those two years, it was a class for an hour a week, kind of looking at the periphery, looking into Judaism. Whereas going into a class with one of the teachers from this based in is intense. Very intense. And it, it has the luxury of being intense because we're not part of any organization. Do you realize that none of the judges is paid one penny? Not one penny. Why? They run yeshivas. They are on what's called Kav Halacha. That's a thing where there's a 24-hour hotline from around the world in different languages. Let's say you're in the hospital with your wife, there's some emergency going on, there's a halakhic issue, you know, which way can this operation be done, because there's certain things that come up, and, you know, you need an answer at 3 o'clock in the morning. Well, so get on Kav Halacha. It may route you to Australia, okay, but um, these rabbis are paid well. They're based in. It's a position of prestige. No one is paid one penny. The fees go to the secretarial staff, to the hacker, of the, um, uh, and to, to the rent of the building. Um, but uh, there's, it's, they have very high standards, and they do it well, because they don't have to answer to anybody except Hashem. And if they were too tough on somebody, so what? You know, they don't have to answer to anyone. And... Um, their toughness is only because they want to make sure that the person is doing it for the right reason. At the same time, I had one student, they were very tough on her. And there was a reason, it doesn't matter what it was. She went through a little bit of uh, difficulty getting through that based in. A very destitutely poor person. When she later on ended up getting married, she you know sent a um, you know, a message to, uh, to one of the rabbis there that she's getting married. And he said, where's the wedding? She said, probably in the, in the apartment that we're going to rent. She's going to have 10 people there. 
The base then paid for a 200 people wedding, helped her for the first few months of rent, free of charge. And she had never paid the base in one cent, by the way. So when we hear about charlatan groups and things, you have to understand there's a real Judaism out there. And there are some real Bastins out there. But we're unfortunately in a real world with governments that cause problems. And my suggestion is do not do any conversions in Israel. If anybody has any ideas of doing it, something they're moving there, finish up here and, and do, do that. Um, if you want better instruction, there's a number of teachers. Those ladies who don't want to learn with a guy on the phone, if they feel that, uh, there's plenty of women teachers. There's more women teachers than guy teachers. Um, so, uh, you know, you can feel comfortable. And there's another thing between the teachers of the Basin, and we never tell the, the rabbis of the Basin. If there's ever a personality problem, between one of the teachers and the student, and has nothing to do with the religiosity, just we're just not getting along. Um, feel free to say, can I have a number of one of the other teachers? And we do not tell the rabbis in the basement. They just switch, go to somebody else, okay? Just because I don't like you doesn't mean that you can't become Jewish, okay? In fact, Rabbi Karelitz, uh, the head of the basement, said to me at one point, he said, I don't care if you like the person or not. What does that have to do with Judaism? Um, so, um, okay, uh, just a couple things so you can understand what types of changes in life it means to go through a real conversion. The women, your mode of dress has to change drastically. The guys, your time isn't your own anymore. If you have free time, the question is always, why aren't you learning now? Oh, you, you're working? You're supporting your family? That's fine. But if you're Jewish and you're not working right now, why are your feet up? Why are you watching the television? Shouldn't you be learning Torah? If you're a woman or a guy, what you speak about, who you speak with, what you think, Yes, Hashem is even in Hadre Hadarim, even in closed rooms. And the biggest Hadre Hadarim, the biggest closed room is your own mind. And you have to be very honest with yourself that you are doing this for the absolute right reasons and are being completely committed. If you're not, don't do it. Unlike the Christians who are doing anything to pull people in, because they've got something of a mission to change the world in that way, we have a mission of changing the world by changing ourselves. A light unto the nation doesn't mean we blaze the world down. What does a light do? It sits where it is. Somebody wants to come to it because it wants to see it. You're a good example. If you want to come, the door's open. But the door's only open if you want to open it. And that's up to you. Um, there is a misconception, kind of. Um, one thing that all Jews know, I don't know how they know it because I can see it in actual sources myself, even though I know one exists, um, that you have to push the gear away three times. It's not in the Talmud. It's not in the Shulchan Aruch. It's not on any of the commentaries on the Shulchan Aruch, on any of the versions that you'll see on the Shulchan Aruch on the page. There is one commentary, which I was told about by the rabbi, that yes, there is one commentary, not on any of the pages of the Shulchan Aruch, that actually does say this, but it's not a standard opinion. We're not in the business of pushing people away. What the Talmud says is make them aware. Make them aware of what it is that they're getting into. Make them realize that at this time when the Messiah is not here, we're downtrodden by the rest of the world. Everyone hates the Jews. And that you're in a religion that is highly responsible. Your level of intensity in the service is so much more than what people know from Western religions. We look at any of the Christian groups. The, is there any religion that says that you have to say a blessing when you leave the bathroom? Why? Judaism is in every halacha, walking in life. It means you are 
we're connected to Hashem in every aspect of your life. There is nothing so low that Hashem is not there. By the way, you can't say that bracha unless your hands are clean in a halachic way. And by the way, not only that, but when you're actually in the bathroom, which hand do you do it with? How do you wipe? This all sounds very gross. There is no aspect of your life that is not completely controlled by the laws of Hashem. Hashem did not put us into a physical world so that we could have some fun and here or there meet Hashem like somebody meets somebody in church on Sunday. Judaism is you are walking with Hashem in absolutely every aspect of your life. What you eat, what you speak, what you think, what you dress in, what you do, what you learn, what you don't learn, what you read, what you will never think of reading. My home, there is no internet. I'm not telling you you all can't have it. I understand in America, having no internet is like having no legs, okay? Um, so um, I have no internet. Um, and one of the main reasons is what's on the internet, a lot of it is pretty bad. Also, learn to control yourself. I have eight kids. I cannot control my eight kids. I have bad enough trouble controlling myself, okay? Um, and just ask my kids. They'll tell me I have more trouble than, than you know. Uh, but uh, anyway, um, what we look at, what newspapers we get, what garbage we feed into our brains, all this has to change when you become Jewish. What stores we shop at, you can get a dress there. What social events, what types of friends we're with, you'll find on your own. You'll see, Reuben has told me, and I've seen this by, I would say all my students, but let's just, it's most of my students, that your friends te seem to just melt away on their own. Um, when they start talking about, did you hear what Sally did yesterday? <laughs> and you say, I'm sorry, that's Lush and Hara. I'm not allowed to hear that. What do you mean? You're not going to talk about people? Like, what do you talk about? Flowers? <laughs> you know, and so, and, you know, so you just lost that group of friends. Um, when people realize that you actually don't believe in, uh, you know, what the Christians call God, you lost those people, which you probably had that happen to you already. But more than anything, the religious intensity of your lifestyle, as people said to my wife when she was becoming religious, they said, what are you, a nun? And, um, and, my wife and, and my wife said, that's nowhere near as intense as Orthodox Judaism. And that's exactly right. So it's not that we push people away. It's that we tell them what this really is. And what this really is, is truth. You're in this world for a very short period of time. There isn't much time. If you want to do something which is the most important thing anybody could ever do, which brings you eternal meaning, then you're in the right place. But it's hard work. And nothing that you, nothing that you would get easily is worth it. In fact, the Darach Hashem says, and it's quoted in the book, the Darach Hashem is the Maharal. He says that, uh, sorry, sorry, the Ramchal. Uh, so the Ramchal says that, um, person is put into this world, which is a world of darkness. And you're put in here to change the darkness into light. And that is not a simple job. It is work. Being a Jew is a constant, constant effort of feeling that Hashem is looking over your shoulder. In my own career as a sofa, I write mezuzahs and tefillin. And um, I've actually somehow kind of like happened, people kept pushing me into a higher and higher level of them so that it's now the, uh, they're extremely stringent um, uh, law. Anybody who's got an extra stringency, that's, uh, I do it. Okay, so the first class that I went to on becoming a sofa, the, the rabbi was speaking to the three of us, and three students, and he said, um, if you do not feel that Hashem is looking over your shoulder all day, do yourself a favor. Walk out the door. Because if you sit here and you write it, one mezuzah, or one tefillin, where you didn't do something correctly, that person doesn't have a mezuzah. That person never put on tefillin. That person said a bracha on tefillin, two brachas every day for the rest of his life, on, which is breaking Hashem's will, breaking some of the Ten Commandments twice a day because of you? 
He said, just if you're not willing to get to that level, then walk out. And my response to that is, that's Judaism. That's not just being a sofer. That's not just being a scribe. If you're not willing to have Hashem be part of your life in every aspect of your life, then don't go there. Stay at Nativ and learn to be a good Ben Noah, which is respectable. And as a don't destroy Hashem's world and do many good things and many extra mitzvahs as a volunteer. But if you want more, there's so much more out there than you could possibly imagine. It is so much more. There is no minute of our lives that is not filled with meaning. But it's hard. More questions? Do you think the Ben Noach, at the moment he convert to Judaism, is part of the Tikkun Olam? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, first of all, I can tell you that I've had so many students who came from Moldova. Moldova used to be called the Pale of Russia. It was a certain point when 70% of the people in the area were Jewish. You can't find a Jew there today, except for my students. Uh, okay. uh, so uh, they have opened up their own base midrash. Um, and, um, so, so many of these people have Jewish roots. So many people are Moranos, especially in the Spanish countries. They don't even know about their backgrounds. It's people coming home. And even those who are not, we know that everyone who would eventually become a Jew, their soul was standing at Mount Sinai. It's real. It's very real. And I've had students who felt it immediately after the mikvah. I have students who've called me a month later and said, I don't know when this happened, but I look back to who I was, and I can't tell you I felt anything, but I look, who was she? <laughs> and um, they really feel something very real happened. What about those who later realized they made a mistake? There are other based ins that I know of that their rates are not as high as our based in. Our based in has a 90 plus success rate of people who, five years later, 10 years later, are still very religious Jews. Um, those few, it's a tragedy. Because we didn't help them, we hurt them. Had they stayed a Ben Noah, they would have been fine. But now they're a non-religious Jew. That's a tragedy. And um, so think long and well before making a decision that is forever and for your children. The older people, so you don't have the decision for your children. It's just you. It's still true. It's still a decision for life. I had one couple. I told you only half the story. Um, they had been very involved in missionary activity. After a while, realized the uh, scam of the whole thing. And they, he went, they, they both went through the conversion. She was starting Alzheimer's. It was just starting. He was PhD, sharp, sharp as a whip. He said, we've been going through this for so long without direction. We've done so much for the Jewish world. All she wants to do is die as a Jew. There are days that she's not there, that she's not with it, and there's days that she is. The basin actually did the conversion. When they walked out of the mikvah, he had a heart attack. He did. He lived, but um, the situation is right now, What's going to be with her? All their children think they're going to hell. They've got nobody who cares anything about them. And they've already said, you know, well, if dad, dad, if you die, we're putting her into a Christian home. This is, you have to realize that there's a lot of repercussions. It's like throwing a stone into the water. There are ripples. 
making this decision real quick, like when I was in high school and college and hearing people who were, you know, coming, you know, Catholic and they just went through this conversion, they're becoming Protestant, they went through this, they went out, they had the baptism. It's like, you know, a knee jerk. Oh, let's just do it. Because, like, you know, it's the fling of the guts for today, you know, gut fling. Um, that's not how you handle going into truth. That's how you handle going into falsehood. Question I'm making Aliyah, and I don't know if all my information is correct because it came from a friend of mine. She was born into a Jewish family, mother and father Jewish, and she uh, did her bat mitzvah and everything. After she married, she essentially converted to Christianity, and I met her through a Messianic uh, synagogue. Um, she's thinking, she's in her 50s now, she's wanting to make Aliyah, and she was telling me that she needed a letter from a rabbi stating that she was a practicing Jew. Right. If Israel is such a secular state, why is that part of... They don't like missionizing. Mm -hmm. Jews, look, my family, 72 members of my mother's family, were killed in the Holocaust, mm -hmm. and, you know, mm -hmm. the Jews have a lot of allergy to people doing things against the Jewish people. Whether we think that what they're doing is bad or not doesn't matter, it's against the Jewish people. And so Israel has a certain hyper, hyper attitude towards somebody's going to attack the Jews, even if they themselves never followed a mitzvah and hate the mitzvahs. You're doing this against the Jews? You know, the, the, the country has got this allergy um, for this. So. Missionaries are not welcome. Um, there are some there. Mm -hmm. We've discovered a number of them. We've done some issues to try to deal with some of them. And uh, so I, my activism kind of ended. I handed it to somebody else. Um, so um, I no longer uh, you know, dealing with running through the, uh, the, the railroad cars in Moscow. It's, I, it's too old, been there, done that. Um, and so leave that for the young people. Um, so, um, but anybody who has a missionary past, it's a problem. Now, my suggestion is there's a book on the back shelf there but written by Ashira who, uh, and by Mikhail Lawson. Contact Mikhaela because even though Ashira is great, Michaela um, is, an, is one of the main missionary busters in Israel. She can steer you in the right direction of what will the government accept, what will they not accept. Sometimes they have a, a memory of an elephant, and even if the person's 100%, they got the wrong type of letter, they got the wrong attitude, the file's closed, there's nothing you can do about it. Versus if you went at this with a bristle of seichel, a little bit of uh, brains, then the problem could have been steered away from. And therefore, go to somebody who's done it. Michaela was an extremely active missionary and went through proper conversion and it made Aliyah. It can be done. Okay? This person um, you know, w was involved with Christianity but is Jewish. They should have the rights to go there. But all of the immigration lawyers in the world cannot fight City Hall in Israel. It is not a democracy in the way that you think of in America. It comes from a, bis a little bit of Turkish law mixed with English law and it has a little bit of, uh, there's too much, the Texans like this, okay, the government has a little bit too much control. Okay, and, um, and as such, it doesn't work in the same type of de democratic ways that we think. It calls itself democracy with a little bit of dictatorship involved. And as such, um, you got to know the right strings and go to people who've dealt with it. There's a lot of good people coming, coming from the Christian world, and there's a lot of good people who are Jewish who are coming from the Christian world, people who went into Jews for uh, Yashki or whatever and uh, end up coming out wonderful. But the government doesn't want to see them. There's ways to get in. Deal with the people who've done it and know what it is. So. Yes, there are missionaries who have done it, unfortunately. Mm, unfortunately. Rabbi, I have a question. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to use a name because it's the only one that everyone would recognize. Someone like Rod, um, who for years was that Christian head, and then ha would have a harder time than, let's say, I would. Yes. Because his background 
shows it for a long period of time and it, being a Christian. So would you fight for someone like that? Absolutely. Gotcha. Absolutely. You get to know the person as they are now. Absolutely. So like someone with my background who was very secular and hard at secularism, materialism, but has switched, it's extremely obvious. Do you see what I'm saying? And so you know where that person is. So you go based on where the person is today. Absolutely. I could sit down in front of you and you could question me for hours and you would know where I was at. Like I said, I think I said it yesterday, I have had students who are cold-blooded murderers, prostitutes, okay. drug dealers, okay. missionaries, you name it. You know, it's amazing the people who come through. Correct. Uh, the murderer actually didn't go through. <laughs> Not because he was a murderer, but because gotcha. of his commitment. And That's what I'm saying. You when go when you were going through that list, I turned on my wife and said, hey, there's hope for me. There's <laughs> <laughs> so. That's why with been being yeah. around him for over 10 years. I've seen that. I mean, do you see what I mean? Not that I'm... I'd fight for him. ...in the process of, of being able to judge that person. <laughs> but you just know. I'll tell you the worst fight I ever had, and this had nothing to do with the government. There was a certain lady from England who had a certain um, mental disease. I forgot what it's called. It's um, not delusions, whatever it is. She needed to be... No, she went on... She needed medications, and if not, she felt a certain aura that something was going wrong when the medication... when there was a, a dis imbalance. And then she... Yeah, but it wasn't exactly schizophrenia. And she would be... When she went into the hospital one time in England, um, she said, I'm on a hunger strike until you get me kosher food, because I know in the next 24 hours, I'm going to be running up and down the halls naked. And, you know, and, you know, and I won't know what's going on, but I want to make sure that there's kosher food here. And so um, when I brought her to the basin, and I knew that there were faxes coming in from everybody who wanted her to not go through, right? Um, I went to Rough Corellitz. They had their stack of papers. I happened to have somebody who works in the offices who does tell me what's going wrong, so I know how to fight in the other direction. So I came with another pile of papers in the opposite direction, because I'm a little bit obnoxious. Um, and so, <laughs> and so, um, and so uh, at the end, they're all fighting, with, and, and you know, all the papers, everything. OK, so I said to Rabbi Karelitz, when she's crazy, she's not well, she doesn't have any obligation to follow the mitzvahs. She's like a retarded person. And when she is sane, she's following the mitzvahs. So what's the problem? And he said, we're doing it. And everyone's screaming, I, 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 we're doing it. She's married, doing great. And since she's become Jewish in the past six years, she has not had a single event. Wow. Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. Tell me the story about the guy from Alaska. That's okay. He's from originally, I'll go a little bit more. He started in Morocco. His mother died. His father beat him, abused him. Then his father died. He and his brother were on the streets. His brother was a drug addict. He was trying to survive. You don't even want to know what he had to go through to actually survive as a kid. Anyway, makes his way to America because one of his parents had an American passport. Okay, and um, in his early 20s, was working in the salmon. I don't know what this is. Maybe you guys do. Salmon bridges under the water, which need to be welded up in somewhere near Alaska. And it's, it's some type of a whole. It's some type of a whole system of these metal things. I don't know what it is. Anyway, so. Okay, so he was he was doing the welding underwater. Okay, so he was doing the welding underwater, and there was a collapse. He was trapped, and there was a lack of oxygen. There was some oxygen coming through the tube, but not a complete supply. When he came out, so what's the result? Um, I don't know about the immediate. Okay, the result is he can talk, he can act like a regular person. He can't control a checkbook. That type of calculation is beyond him. So 
I was trying to teach him to become Jewish. This guy was so committed, you could cry. It was unbelievable. One deep, deep person. Any type of calculated thought, you know, worry, well, if then, da, 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 forget the Gemara. Okay, just no way. Okay, and trying to think about, well, what happens in this situation when that goes on in Halacha, and he couldn't think that way on his own. He didn't seem like a stupid person in regular conversation, but when you had to got into halakhic things, it was a problem. So at a certain point, I saw the base that is not um, thinking that they're going to do it. They didn't say anything. I told him to leave the room, and I said, uh, we can't demand of somebody more than Hashem demands of them. They can only follow the Torah as much as they can not as much as we'd like them to, okay? Um, I don't really know why the based in keeps sending me people, because I have uh, caused them more problems than anybody else. Um, I don't let them get away with anything, okay? And um, it's, uh, it can get feisty. Not everybody fits into a square box. And uh, in fact, most people don't. Everybody's got some problem. But they also know, I think maybe this is why, I'm not putting anybody through who shouldn't. There was one guy who came to my house from South Africa. He had donated two different hospitals to Jewish communities over there um, as a complete donation. This guy uh, wasn't poor. Uh, and so his wife is not Jewish. His son is just about ready to be the age of bar mitzvah. He decided. We're going to go through a conversion here. Showed up at my door. I don't know how. And um, after a certain while, I started turning to her. And after the things that Mikhail Lawson had taught me about missionary checking, I started asking my own questions. And at a certain point, I said, you do believe in uh, Yashkafanjik, right? Okay. And the 13, 12, 13 year old boy looked at his mother and said, Ma, who are you? And um, I have a feeling, I hope, that this boy will eventually one day find his way to my door when he becomes 18. But I told the father, No. Put down on the table a very high pile of uh, green paper. And I said, I will never do anybody in the older people of your family. If your son comes to me later on his own, as in, you know, a young adult, mm -hmm. I can deal with him, and I won't take any pay. But you know, that's just not the way it works. You know, I'll fight for somebody, blood and guts, if they're real. But if they're not real, goodbye. So, anyway. Anybody else? Any other questions? Time over. Like even Spanish, not all Spanish people, but sometimes they say that, or some of them not even that they find out that they're Jewish, like Hamza back in generation. Oh, um, yes, this is a big thing. Okay. Um, you have to see it on a gravestone, like a rubbing, or yeah. Like I've heard of different stories like that. Let's deal with real halachic answer and not hearsay. Um, it isn't what people think. I have people who have come to the base in with, <laughs> with um, <laughs> you know, they, you know, they tried so much to prove where they're from and what, and so much research and everything, and they come to the base in completely shocked. Rav Nissen Kuralts has his very straight halachic view. He said, I don't care how many papers you have said, was there one generation from birth to death that was not part of a Jewish community, that other Jews did not know that they were Jewish? If there is one break, so where'd you come from? The moon? How do we know you're Jewish? You want to follow the mitzvahs? Go follow the mitzvahs. You want to consider yourself Jewish? Consider yourself Jewish. But how can the Jewish community accept you as Jewish? How can we have you say a bracha on the Torah? How can we have you be part of the minion? How can we have you touch the wine? If we don't know you're Jewish, all we hear is that you say you're Jewish. Papers? That's nothing. 
as proof of fact, what my grandfather did um, during the process of the Russian Revolution and the process of the walls going down um, uh, was creating false documents. And my, not for himself, and that was what he did for other people. You know, don't tell the police. Um, anyways, <laughs> he's dead. They can't arrest him anyway. Uh, unless you're Mormon, they could probably convert him when they're dead, right? They can, pro they can baptize him when he's dead. They can probably arrest him when he's dead. Also, anyway, so, um, so, uh, so, uh, and my great, great grandfather, and I knew my great grandmother well, because just her father, just one generation, um, escaped with hundreds of boys who, during uh, pogrom type activity in the Ottoman Empire um, when they were w went to Poland. Yes, I'm partially Sephardic. So, um, and so um, we looked at the records. We know he was there. We have pictures of him, of his brother in the uh, Ottoman Empire army. Yet we have the documents of them being born in Poland. So uh, documents are not meaningful at all, at all. Gravestones, for a real halakhic basin, they don't care. We need to know that there was a, you know, for example, people know his story. His mother was Jewish. She was part of a Jewish community. She doesn't have to have been religious, okay? She, people, Jewish people knew her to be Jewish, okay? That's it, okay? It doesn't matter, you're raised in the convent, you're raised in this, it doesn't matter. But had that been his grandmother, even if his mother knew, but let's say it was hidden and nobody else knew, sorry, you need a conversion. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have one lady from, I think it was Chicago. They were three generations of women, women mom, grandma, and great-grandma, who had all married uh, non-Jews. But the women knew we're Jewish, but they kept it very quiet. It's a very strange situation. I mean, you look at this Jewish, you look at this lady. I'm telling you, if you look up in the dictionary, Jewish lady, you'd see like, you know, the nice, th this was the Jewish lady par excellence, right? You know, and um, so, you know, it's like, you know, when she came in for a conversion, one of the judges said, are you kidding? <laughs> and, uh, and so, um, but we found out, now she said, we all knew we were Jewish. But the state of Israel wouldn't accept her. And then she came to us, and we said, you have to follow Shabbos. Unlike what we say to converts in the process, that you know, you don't, you're not allowed to, you follow Shabbos until the, just the last little thing, one thing you don't do. That you have to, because you know yourself to be Jewish. We can't accept you into community until you go through a conversion. And they actually made her say a bracha at the conversion, because they said nobody knew of their being Jewish. The bracha at the mikvah. It's just oh. bracha. To, I'll say it without Hashem's name. I'll say the Shem, Hashem's name differently because you can't say Hashem's name in vain. Baruch Ata Hashem Elokeinu Melech Haolam Sheker Rishanu B'Mitzvah Tivanu Al Hatvila. Because it's the bracha on going on the immersion. Because a woman who has a menstrual cycle has to go to the mikvah, so she has to say a bracha on going to a mikvah. I as a sofer have to go to the mikvah because I'm writing Hashem's name. I built a mikvah in my basement, okay, because I go every time I've slept for more than 30 minutes, if my children will ever let that happen, <laughs> I have to then go to the mikvah. Um, and, um, but a person who doesn't have to go to the mikvah, maybe she is Jewish, okay, then they don't have to say the bracha. And to say Hashem's name in vain is a Torah uh, prohibition. So to say a rabbinic commandment of a bracha when you have a possibility of a Torah prohibition, you can't do that, right? But here they said this is not called a doubt. When a woman has had, or a man, doesn't matter, a person has had a more than a generation of separation from the Jewish community, it is an obligation to go through a conversion if they want to be considered part of the Jewish community. So uh, when you consider a generation for somebody who's considering this here, um, I'm Jewish, but if my mother was Jewish, but married into Christianity, and she became Christian. But um, people knew her to be Jewish? Say generation. Are you talking about another But people, it doesn't matter that she went to Christianity. I, I Did know. you know, in other Is words, her cousins knew her? Jew, Jew? Is that no, her cousin, no. Her cousins knew her? 
this isn't the true story. Okay, fine. No, okay, fine. <laughs> now, okay, in other words, not being part of the Jewish community means nobody in the Jewish world knew that you were Jewish. If you had it. You just dropped off the face of the planet. If you what? If you had witnesses that you were Jewish. You were Jewish. It doesn't have to. That's it. That's but it. If they're dead, you don't you have to. What? If, but if they're dead, the witnesses are dead. You don't have anything. That, there are people like that, and it, depending on how severe the situation is, sometimes it's with a bracha, sometimes it's not. They have, that's the judgment of the based in. That's not me. That's people who are bigger than me. Okay. Mm -hmm. so that, that, and did you know DNA or anything like that? I don't care. They couldn't care less. They couldn't care less in the based in. It's nothing. Good. Uh, for example, for a male, uh, uh, do the conversion. What? When a male yes. does the conversion. Uh, for the Right. Who do the, the okay. Do like this. Or, um, okay. Yes. Sarah. Okay. For our based in, I can't speak for every based in. For our based in, um, there is a moil who is. There's a very medical room. This looks like you're walking into, like you know, a medical center. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and um, it's done much differently than what I heard by somebody else recently. Um, they cauterize each of the small capillaries underneath. The thing does not, um, what do you call it, get larger or black or whatever. It is very surgically done. There are two, three, four, and then eight. Okay, four mage stitches and eight in between each. So eight times four is 32, 33, 34, 35, 36 stitches. The eight in between are plastic surgery stitches that aren't seen and dissolve underneath the skin. You'll never see them. Okay, and it's done very well, and there's a nurse there too. No, it's not a girl. Um, <laughs> and um, okay, the nurse has a three foot long beard. Um, anyway, so uh, uh, so <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> yes. So it's the same for someone who's already circumcised. Okay, somebody who is already medically circumcised. Going for a medical circumcision does not make you circumcised. It means that you don't have to have the skin removed. Mm -hmm. But they still need to have hatafat dam brit imbracha. They have to have a drop of blood come out with a bracha. Um, it has to be done. It does not have to be done by a moil. I had a hatafat dam brit because it was a question. I didn't know my parents weren't religious. Um, I was told maybe it was a moil, not one of the children didn't have a moil. I didn't. I, I'm like, you know, let's just go and do it. I went to the moil. I said, okay, do it. It's just one drop. He said, no, you do it. <laughs> <laughs> and I was you know, trying to do this, and I was like, I can't do it. So he, he, <laughs> I just can't do it. So, so he did it. And I was shocked because, A, I didn't feel it, and B, there was no blood. He had to push to have the blood come out. And I said, is that normal? He said, Yes, that's what it's always like. Hatafatam, but for a person who has had the surgery, is nothing. It's not, I'd say, you don't feel it five minutes later. You don't feel it when it's happening. There's nothing. So um, it's completely a non-issue for somebody who has the skin removed. And so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're uncovered, uncovered, uncovered. <laughs> yes. I have a question completely different than this discussion. Um, <laughs> now, what, what is your opinion on a person who always feels that Hashem is behind their shoulder, even though as a child and growing up, they did not know him by that name. Um, but what, I mean, like the, the people who went into captivity, the northern tribes, the, the ten tribes, um, I know there's a difference of opinion in the Talmud, whether they will return or not, or what is your opinion? Are some of us, perhaps? Okay, I'll give you a And that's why we get the thing that won't let us go. Okay, as far as the ten tribes, I've seen a number of books that are missing. A, they're missing a small detail called the Book of Jeremiah. It's a small little detail that before the exile of Yehuda and Binyamin and those of Levi who were mainly in that uh, area, um, 
including the Kohanim. Jeremiah the prophet went out to exile and brought back remnants from each of the ten tribes, put them into, put them, brought them, put them, not a piece of candy, okay, brought them into um, the uh, territory of Yehuda, and they went into exile with all the rest and have been multiplying and every, just like everyone else, okay? So people talk about the lost tribes. What lost tribes? We all went into exile together, okay? We all went through Babylon together. We all went through the second exile together, okay? And um, now what about the majority of the, those yeah, tribes that are over there? Christians. There are many, many Jews all over the world who don't know that they're Jews. 10% of the Roman Empire at one point was Jewish. Um, now, if you think about what that means, and normal population increase, there are Jews everywhere. But just because you think you're Jewish isn't necessarily enough. I'll give you a great example. These Ethiopians that I helped. What I did to get those people out, this was not a standard family. Just give you a quick, quick, short, I can do it. Okay, um, so um, I was in the army. This was right after the first wave of Ethiopians had come out. One of my closest friends was the son of a Kes, uh, which is like a rabbi um, in the Ethiopian community. And um, he came in one day in the army crying what was going on. He had gotten word what's going on with his two brothers and his sister. And combined with their children, it was over 20-something people. Um, one of his brother's children, who was a teenager, um, was killed by the uh, magistrate's mm -hmm. child. The family then, somebody went and killed the murderer. The posse was sent out against the entire family, which meant all the relatives. They were running from city to city. We had the, the bridge crossing the Gundar River had been blown up. We bought trucks. We had people meeting them at different border crossings. We were dealing with things going against the government over there via the Israeli government, a mess. We did everything to get these people out. Baruch Hashem, they got out, and the baby was born on the plane. Okay, so, um, so, um, why am I telling you this? I'm not prejudiced. I'm not anti-black. I risked a lot to help get those people out. Are the Ethiopians Jewish? They claim they're from the ten tribes. They need a conversion, according to Ashkenazic Pesach. According to Sephardic Pesach, mm -hmm. not. It's a difference of opinion. What is the Ashkenazic Sakh based on? Lo yamush Torah Hashem mepicha mepizar ha adolam. No word of the Torah will ever leave your mouth or your children's mouth forever. There is no Jewish community, whether it's in Kazakhstan or Yemen or in the Caucasian mountains or nowhere, that doesn't have all five books of, of the Torah, doesn't have all of the books of the Tanakh. Even those who left, like Yemen, in the first exile, they have every book of the Talmud, every single word of the Talmud, not one word missing. They've got all the commentaries. They have the Shulchan Aruch, which was only written 500 years ago. Okay, how did they get it? There's no Jewish community that doesn't have it all. And in Ethiopia, which had relationships with the Jews in Yemen, very close relations with the Jews in Yemen, they don't even have the Torah. So is there any other community that's missing anything? No. They have nothing. And so it's, if Hashem promises that it will not leave your children's mouth, how is it that it did? Okay, now, Rabbi Feinstein said, but they are Moser Nefesh, Biglal Yahudusam. They are they're risking their lives and putting, they're being put into danger because of their beliefs that are very similar to our beliefs. And they believe in one God, and we have the obligation to save them. Consequently, I did all my, as my mother calls it, my nourish kite. Um, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, and um, so um, yes, we have to say them. And yes, I brought these people to the basin. And yes, every time 
every time that I'm at the base in with people who are coming from America or Norway or wherever, there's a couple of these people from Ethiopia who have come into a more religious attitude, end up going into yeshiva, and one of the first things the yeshiva says is, you're welcome, but go to the base in. And the base accepts them, no questions asked. And they make it very easy. It's a one day in and out. Because they, because they think what you people have gone through to become Jewish. You're here. You're in yeshiva. We're not causing any problems. In and out. So. In all the Ethiopian people in the early 1900s, like the middle 1900s, kept the kibbutz because they had several operations <coughs> like this and the wings of the eagles and different um, rescue efforts to take people from Most the of the ones. If you see them walking around with yarmulkes and tzitzis, mm -hmm. they've probably gone through a conversion. Mm -hmm. So I was very involved with these people. I was in, once his family got out, and I was in their home all the time. And to be in the home of the Kess, I sat there with his scroll, which was only about three sheets of parchment, uh, which was, he, he translated it to me. He, he said it in, um, what's the name of the language? Gez, I think, or whatever it is. Um, and so his son translated it to Hebrew. And then I translated it to my father, who was there at the same time. Was this, really, this was really, <laughs> it took a long time. We went through the three sheets. All it is is a story of Pesach. That's it. The story of Moses taking the people out of Egypt. That's it. There's no laws except not to eat matzah, or not to eat uh, chametz. That's their entire book. So to say they're Jews is not without question. And it has nothing to do with what some people may hear, that where the state of Israel said, see, the Ashkenazic are very anti-black. What's the connection? Uh, so, yeah. I have, I have one question I would like for you to address, uh, and we're about at the end of our line, so we have to get to the airport and things yeah. like that. So uh, the question is, um, does a person have to know like volumes of Torah, Parsha, no. okay. Matra, okay. okay. I don't care if you know any Jewish history. I don't care if you know any Tanakh. I don't care if you know any Hebrew. Okay. The all that we care about is that at the base then is that you know the content of what's in the Don Alam, which is Jewish Ashkafa, what our beliefs really are. Okay, and that's why the book was written, so I don't have to give the second half of the class. Okay, that's months of what people would learn in one book. And the other half is halacha, what you have to do. And people come in with so much side knowledge, which is a waste of time. That you'll learn when you're Jewish. You don't need that to be Jewish. You need to know what brachas to say. You need to know what to eat. You need to know how to follow Shabbos. You need to know how to be dressed. You need to know... How, what is Lashon Hara, how to check food for bugs, what, you need to know many things that are halacha, which, by the way, can be made fun. The way I deal with people is I say, you know, here's this 500-page book, read it, don't memorize it, skim through it. Like you're preparing for, you know, when I had double major and like, you know, a bunch of things, just... Okay, you know, you're not trying to actually, you know, give a real report on this. You're trying to get a basic idea of what's going on. And then we have the classes where the pieces are put together. I don't expect people to come in with notes or whatever. You want questions? Fine. But like I tell them before we learn the laws of Shabbat, read Shemir Shabbat Kehilchata. It's, I think, 700 pages. So do it in a week. I mean, just. You got the basic idea? Next chapter. You know the basic terms? Next chapter. Okay, come on in. I'm not testing you. I just want to know that you're, that you're not unfamiliar with the subject, okay? Um, a baseline. Basic, a baseline. Um, at the same time, you will know, unless you're you know, a little bit stuffed up in the head, you will know better than most people who have been Jewish their whole lives, who are religious as far as the actual halacha. Why? Because I teach it to you structurally. 
What's a rabbinic commandment? What's a Torah commandment? What's a minhag, which is a tradition? What's a stringency? What's not a stringency? What do the Sephardic say? What do the Ashkenazic say? Why? You're coming into a Jewish community. All of a sudden, you're going to see something done differently than the way you th learned it. You're going to think either you were turned wrong or he's a guy. Okay? And so, therefore, you need to know how do you do this properly. And um, it doesn't take that long. If you have a fun method of doing it, if you have a rapport with the people you're teaching, it works.